Those of you who watched my videos on my channel here in the past know that I usually am talking about photography, cameras, or how to use photography related software. But in the past, when I would produce a video, I would mostly set up in my living room each time. I'd bring in the lights, move furniture, set up my camera, hook up my sound equipment. And no sooner than I had everything all set up, my wife would tell me about the guests that we're having over that evening. Consequently, everything had to be taken down and put away. This part was really a drag, especially if I had to reshoot something because the next day it all had to go back to the exact same spots so the lights and the camera had some continuity with the shot I made the day before. To solve this problem, I built out an area that's dedicated just to creating YouTube videos. And in this video, I'll show you how I put all this together. All that coming up. Hi, I'm Terry Vanderheiden, professional photographer, here to show you how I built my little YouTube studio. I've had some viewers of my channel notice the change in my videos, and they've emailed me to ask me to give them a breakdown of how I put this new studio together. So let's get started on that. The first thing I needed to do was to find a spot. If you're gonna make your own YouTube studio, you can use a spare room or a garage, and the shell that I started with was a pretty raw space. It had concrete floors and no interior walls to speak of. The first thing I wanted to do was to control the sound. So instead of a concrete floor, I took two by fours on their sides and built a frame and set that on the floor. And then I laid down sheets of three quarter inch plywood and screwed those all together. This is simply building a subfloor. Next, I filled every area I could with insulation, as thick as I could buy, not only for keeping this area from getting too hot or too cold, but also to absorb sound. Insulation material went into every surface between the wall studs. Particularly, I wanted to insulate the ceiling. Then that takes the brunt of the heat from the roof. And I also wanted that to be insulated. I also wanted to make sure that the fluffiness of the insulation would keep the sound from bouncing around. Next up was wallboard. I hauled in a few sheets of sheetrock to attach to the studs. I only needed to cover the area that would be seen by the camera. So that meant I didn't have to put sheetrock everywhere in the room. My thought was to minimize the hard reflective surfaces in the room so the sound recordings wouldn't pick up as many noise reflections. The rest of the room was just left with the insulation between the wall studs. After I taped the joints in that one corner area that would be seen by the camera, I used joint compound on the tape and the screw heads and smoothed everything out. After a little sanding, I painted everything with a primer and then the final paint job. I chose a dark color for the paint on the walls as I was keeping in mind how my lighting was going to work. With a dark color on the walls, I could add color light to the walls and it would show. But with light colored walls, color light wouldn't really show up as well. Lastly, I covered the floor with a thick carpet pad and then attached the carpet to tack strips along the edges. Now I went on to YouTube to learn how to lay carpet and I learned that this is not something I ever want to do again. Now when I'm making a recording in here, I'm not going to get the sound bouncing off the hard concrete. It'll be absorbed into the subfloor and into the carpet. With all the construction done, I then had to figure out my lighting. I knew I wanted LED lights because I didn't want it to get too hot in here while I was working on the recordings. While I use Ari Sky panels for my commercial videos I shoot because they're bright and they can adjust color on them super accurately, I didn't need anything quite that robust or expensive for this permanent setup. Again, I wanted the lights to just stay here. I didn't want to have to pull them down and take them on location for a commercial shoot. I ended up going with the Godox SL152. I bought these on Amazon, so they're really easy to get. I knew I needed four lights total. Two is my main light, and one is a background light, and one for a separation light. I'll show you how I have all these set up. I didn't want light stands taking up space, so the two main lights are mounted into these little light stand studs called Matthews LB2 Location Baby Brackets. These are sturdy little stubs that are simply screwed into two by sixes that I fastened up to the ceiling joists. These brackets hold the Godox lights upside down and can shine down and face me while I'm talking. The two main Godox lights are placed in the Godox CS65D soft boxes. This makes the main light much softer when it hits the subject, which is me. It was important to me to keep these lights high because I wear glasses. If the lights were too low, they'd cause reflections in my glasses. 
but if I moved them up high, it would eliminate that sort of thing. Next, I needed to create a soft separation light. This light's used to light up the desk and over my back and shoulders so that I don't blend into the background, hence the name separating me from the background, a separation light. The soft box I chose for this is wide and narrow, roughly one foot by four feet. This is the Godox 12 by 47 with a honeycomb grid. What this grid does is help reduce the spread of light. This setup controls the light and keeps it from shining back in the camera, which would reduce contrast in the overall image. Here's a sample of the separation light on that separates and puts light on my shoulders and then without a separation light. So I like separation light better, so that's what I went with. The last light is just the same Godox SL150 as the rest, but it's set to shine through just a plain reflector and down on the background. Now I can put a color gel over this light to change the color of the background if I want some variety. The Godox lights can be operated with a remote, so I can turn them off when I'm setting them up, or if I want to change the ratios of the light, I can do that right from the remote. The next challenge I had was to figure out how I would record the sound. For the most part, the camera does record sound, but I only use that as a synchronization tool, and the term is called scratch audio. So the camera is recording the scratch audio. The real or the usable sound is recorded with better microphones that are much closer to me. They're not on the other side of the room where the camera is. Now here's the difference of using a camera microphone and then using a dedicated microphone that's synchronized later in post. Here's the sound of the camera's microphone. You can hear all the room noise as the sound has to travel across the room to get recorded by the camera mic. And here's the sound being recorded from an independent microphone, a shotgun mic, that's directed towards me. And I'll sync this in the video editing software later. On the wall, I installed an articulating boom that is made by Newer that attaches to the wall and holds a Rode shotgun microphone. This arm is able to move up, down, and side to side. And it's no doubt sturdy enough to actually hold a light, but I'm just using it for the microphone. This microphone is just up out of the view of the camera and then points down towards me. This boom is important because if I want to stand to do a presentation, I can just push the boom up a little higher and out of the shot. The other microphone I use is the Neumann TLM-103. This is attached to an articulating arm that's best used as close to my face as possible. Now, I've been using this mic for the past few years to record my podcast, the Nature Photography Podcast. If you haven't listened to the podcast, it's a podcast dedicated entirely to everything about nature photography, and it can be found on all the major podcast players, Apple, Spotify, Google, etc., the Nature Photography Podcast is listened to in over a hundred different countries and on all seven continents. I think that's pretty cool. And it all starts right here with this microphone. Let me let you take a listen to how each microphone sounds. So here's the shotgun microphone from up above. Thanks for checking out my YouTube channel. If you're enjoying this kind of content, hit the like button and be sure to subscribe and hit the little bell to be reminded of my next video. So now here it is from the Neumann microphone right up close. Thanks for checking out my YouTube channel. If you're enjoying this kind of content, hit the like button and be sure to subscribe and hit the little bell to be reminded of my next video. Since the Neumann sounds best right next to me, it's not always suitable for YouTube videos as it for no other reason than it blocks my face. Well, some people might think that's a good thing to block my face. It can be distracting, but most importantly, it can follow up the autofocus on my camera. I've had the camera focus on the microphone first and then me second, so I seldom use it for the YouTube videos. Generally, I use the Neumann for the podcast and the Rode shotgun mic for the YouTube videos. These microphones both feed down in the Rodecaster Pro recorder, and it's also called a production studio because you can do other things than just record on it. Here I'm able to adjust the gain on up to four microphones, enabling me to mix in other microphones if I have guests on the podcast or guests on my videos. 
When I'm recording the Nature Photography Podcast, I can also program music and sound effects into these little sound pads. Let me show you how that works. So if I want crickets in the background, I can raise this or lower it. Or if I say something clever, hey, isn't that great? But what I probably use it for mostly is if I'm going to be transitioning into another section and I want some music in the background. So this is how I typically use the pads. I can fade that in and fade it out. Then I'm just talking and recording all of this at the same time. So it enables me to record the whole podcast and then I can upload it a little quicker. So to hear how things are sounding, I need to use my headphones. And this is probably the main reason I don't use these sound pads when I'm creating a YouTube video. Because I need to hear exactly how loud they are as compared to my voice. Everything's on a slider so I can bring up the sound levels to whatever I like. Through the Rodecaster Pro, all the audio is recorded. And when I'm editing, I use the scratch audio from the camera and line it up exactly in the editing software so they're identical. And then I eliminate the camera audio so all the viewer hears is the good audio that's recorded from the microphones. Since this channel is dedicated to photography, I don't want to skip the camera that I'm using. I use the Nikon Z9 camera set on 8K resolution at 30 frames per second. By shooting 8K, I can easily zoom in in post-production if I want to, without losing any quality. The lens I'm using now is the Nikon Z 50mm 1.2. I shoot this at about f2 in order to get some focus fall off in the background. I'm only just a foot or so away from the background, since I don't have a ton of space in here, this is my workaround, using a real fast lens to give me shallow depth of field. Generally, when I'm shooting video of someone, I like to keep them as far away from the background as I can in order to show off that shallow depth of field. But in a small space like this, I use a very fast lens that offers super shallow depth of field. The camera sits on a tripod behind the beam splitter glass of a teleprompter. The teleprompter has my script loaded into it, and it can help me keep track of where I'm at as I go along. The teleprompter is fed by an older laptop into the screen of the teleprompter where it reverses the text so I can read it on this reflective mirror. This allows me to look directly into the camera when I'm talking to you and not forget something. I just have to read it. The speed of the teleprompter is controlled by this little puck device where I can speed up the words or slow them down. I have it sitting right here on my desk. The desk is a simple sit-stand desk I got from Costco. Why well, I like this one because it was inexpensive and light in color. It acts as a reflector to bounce light up underneath my chin and fill in the light in my eyes. It makes the look a little bit more pleasing. The fact that it's a sit-stand desk will give me the opportunity to sit or stand for a presentation. Also, it's helpful when I'm showing a product from above. If I need more space, I can just lower the desk or raise the desk rather than trying to move the camera up or down. So it's a little faster. The last thing, and it's kind of small, is I installed a big darkroom timer. And that way I can set it for however many minutes I want so it can time how long my presentation is. So I don't generally use this except if I'm doing like a YouTube short. They need to be under 60 seconds, so I need to track that to make sure that I'm speaking fast enough to get every, all my information in within 60 seconds. So that's pretty much it on my little workspace here. I'll put links in the description below if you want to pick up any of these products that you want to use for yourself. Next week, I promise to get back to the normal photography related subjects. Keep in mind, you can always reach me in the comment section below, or you can email me directly at terry at imagelight.com. If you want to support this channel, check out my website, imagelight.com and go over to the digital products page. For things for sale there, like my ebook, Razor Sharp, to help you make sharper photographs. Or you can simply just share the video on your social media or email to others so more people can see it. Until next time, this is Terry Vanderheiden.